All right, so I'm here with Nathan Ackerman, and tell us what the name of your business is and what kind of things you do. Yeah, so we're Chicken Tramper Ultralight Gear, and we make all sorts of outdoors-related products, ranging from full-size backpacks for thru-hiking to day packs, fanny packs, shoulder strap accessories, uh, you know, water bowls for your dog, tote bags, camera bags, all sorts of other stuff like that. And how did you get started with doing ultralight gear? Yeah, so Austin and I, my business partner, uh, both went to Michigan Tech, graduated as mechanical engineers, uh, and then after we graduated, decided to hike on the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, which is the trail that runs from uh, Canada or from Canada to Mexico. Um, and so for that, we decided to make our own bags for it. So we learned how to sew, made, came up with some designs, got some from the internet as well, cobbled them together, started making our own gear, then went out and hiked and basically saw that there was just a lot of room in the market for things that people had on their backpacks that they didn't need or didn't want, and then features that people really wanted that weren't offered. So we're trying to kind of fill that hole in the market of giving the people you know, all the things that they want, not all this extra stuff, and then also trying to capitalize on making things lightweight, but also super durable as well. Gotcha. And uh, can you show us like an example? Of, like this is one of your bags right here, right? Yep, so this is, this is a 50 liter fully framed bag. There's a really old fanny pack in it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> but yeah, so this is uh, one of our flagship products, our 50 liter bag. So this is a fully framed internal frame system with carbon fiber aero shafts and our 3D printed brackets, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we also have two of our other most popular products, our water bottle sleeves and our foam pockets that go on the front of the backpack straps. And these can go on basically any brand of backpack as well. So you don't have to use these just with our products. It uh, will go on pretty much anything. Yeah. So uh, uh, you prototyped most of this stuff, like right? Like this is you and Austin that designed pretty much everything. Yeah, right? pretty much. Yeah, yeah. From idea to paper to muslin to prototype fabric to yeah. like what we have now. This looks way different than what we had beforehand. You know, what we did when we first started was we had a design that we thought was pretty good, but then we wanted to get some miles on it and wanted to get some feedback. So we had this through hiker testing survey program that we sent out a bunch of backpacks to people that were going to hike over a thousand miles or so that summer. Uh, gave us a whole bunch of feedback. So we changed some features around. Uh, you know, updated how we were doing some stitching and stuff and just kind of went through our iterative, iterative design process, uh, which basically is just us making something, see how it works, keep making it again, and just keep improving it as we go. So yeah, everything that we have here basically came from me and Austin working with everybody here at the shop and then people using it as well to just kind of refine it as we go. Gotcha. And so let's get into the 3D printing a little bit. Um, so how is 3D printed how has 3D printing enabled you to um, do some of the designs and some of the, um, the creations you guys have? Yeah, so 3D printing, uh, you know, has been an integral part of CTEL from the beginning. Uh, just because of the versatility of being able to make all of our own plastic parts lets us do different things compared to other companies. Because uh, in our industry, if you don't have a plastic injection molder supplier that makes the thing that you want, you kind of have to make your own molding or you're kind of hosed. So in order to make, the first thing that we used was the these brackets. So nobody makes something like this, right? So this is what allowed us to actually put the carbon fiber frame inside of our backpack. Now these have also gone through a couple different versions as well. Uh, but we can custom make these to the size for the aero shafts that we needed. We could, you know, add all these different ladder locks, change these designs on the fly based on how well they can hold and different things. So it was really nice to be able to 3D print these, test them right away for all the geometry, all that, how it's holding inside the bag, how it's, uh, you know, transferring load through the frame. And you can just run through all those different iterations really, really quickly instead of having to invest all the time and money into getting tooling or soft tooling and getting all that stuff figured out before we actually do a production run. And then because we don't have all that tooling, we don't feel bad about changing the drawing, you know, whenever we want because we can just change it and print new ones. Sure, it's a substantial investment to, you know, get tooling to like do injection molding. And so. Yep, yeah, and especially for something like this where there's, you know, multiple cavities, you know, there's circular cavities going in from two different directions. There's all these different channels and stuff that run inside of where this webbing goes. So even if we were going to do injection molding, it'd be difficult. It'd be really hard. There's a lot of slides, which makes it even more expensive, and then they don't last as long, and you end up with all sorts of tolerance issues based on how everything goes together. So uh, using 3D printing and doing everything layer by layer really gives us a lot more control on the internal geometries of things as opposed to doing things out of injection molding. Yeah. Um, and how 
how has, I mean, obviously these bags are going to go under a lot of wear and tear. Um, historically, how have the 3D printed parts held up? They've done good, yeah. We've had a few uh, that broke early on, and so we went through a lot of phases of different print settings, so either higher infill or uh, you know higher temperature for better layer adhesion or you know more perimeter layers and stuff, increasing our wall thicknesses, basically just to get the strength that we want, uh, mostly in the layer to layer direction. That's you know the, the most critical one, and that's the one that always pops apart. But since we've updated all our settings and things, we haven't had any issues with these brackets yet. And so we have probably 10 to 12 bags that are over 30,000 to 3,500 miles, and then we've got one bag that's at like 4,600 miles. Nice. Uh, and the brackets are still going good. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so in what other ways has 3D printed 3D printing aided um, <laughs> what, you, what you guys do? Yeah, so one of the biggest things, aside from the brackets, is you know doing things like fixtures and making different tools that make sewing things a lot easier. So that can be something as simple as this little guide that goes into one of our CNC machines that holds the piece of fabric down in the right spot, keeps it centered, and then she can run that, Maya will run that on the machine. It's all in the right spot and ready to go. Or something like this, where we line this up in a regular sewing machine, and so we know the distance that uh, this corner is in, so we can make all of our corners uniform. Even to things like that directly go onto the sewing machine. So this is a, a custom-made sewing foot that we made uh, to make sewing our wallets a lot easier, just because most of the feet that you get from a sewing supplier is symmetrical, so it's the same width on either side. So you can get something narrow, which you can fit up next to stuff, but doesn't feed as well, or you can get something wide that feeds really well that you can't get close to things. So this is asymmetrical, so it has a wide foot on one side, so it has more purchase. It can actually feed a little bit better, but then it's narrow on the other side so that we can sneak up against the zipper. So there's a lot of different like fixtures and small things too that even though it's not a production level item like our backpacks or the brackets in there, it's just to help speed up things in the shop and make everything a little bit easier for our sewers and our employees to actually make them. Sure. That's mm -hmm. very cool. And primarily, what material are you, are you printing with? So a lot of these ones for fixtures and things and, and our brackets uh, is all out of PLA, um, so corn plastic. Uh, super easy to work with. It's biodegradable, which is great. Uh, so we don't worry too much about like overprinting these or if we got to print a new one, it's not the end of the world. So pretty much everything uh, that comes off of that printer, which is a Prusa i3, is all in PLA. Um, so two of your products that rely very heavily on 3D printing is your bear can key and your bear spray holder. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about those. And um, Yeah, so, so this is one of our newer products, the, the bear can key. So this is a uh, bear resistant food container, which is what you take you know, up into the back country, into bear country, to make it harder for bears to get in your food. Uh, it's not completely bear proof, but it keeps most of them out. And to open this, there's these little barbs on the side here of this lid that have to get pushed past this nub that's right here. So you push this plastic in and slide it, you push this in and slide it. And it's not too bad right now, but like when you're really tired or if it's cold or something like that and this plastic gets stiff, it can be really hard to push those tabs in to get it to slide, you know, past that nub. So you're holding this and holding the lid pushing these in and turning them against each other at the same time. So there's a lot of different operations in different directions, which is really good for us, you know, keeping food away from the bear because the bear can't get in it, but it's really annoying when you can't get in yourself after a long day of hiking yeah. and you're super hungry. So we came up with this little doodam. So this is our key. So this is just simply a little hood that goes over this nub right here. And it pops over this nub and it's got some lead in angles. So now with this on here, you can just twist it off by hand and you don't have to push anything in with your fingers. It's all automatic. And then we also print a little anchor that goes onto the side here uh, and that comes with a sticky tab to attach it to those. And so this is all 3D printed with our Onyx material on our Mark Forge Mark II printer. Um, and it's been a huge bestseller so far. We've been selling lots of these. And uh, the cool thing about this is that it's lighter than almost all of the other methods of opening this other than just using your hands. A lot of people will like put a credit card in there or a stick or something like that. Because this is 3D printed and is mostly hollow, this weighs less than a quarter, a nickel, a credit card, or a driver's license. So it does a better job and it's lighter and it's more durable because it's made out of that nylon. So it's a lot of really good uh, boons for us to use a 3D printer to come up with something like this, especially in our industry where everybody's very weight sensitive. Yeah. And then the other thing we're coming out with is we're holding bear spray. So this is a bear deterrent spray. So for when the bear is charging you, you pop this out and spray the bear. 
So imagine this is gonna go on my shoulder strap right here. There's some straps that are gonna go with it. And then it's just got this little clip neck and there'll be another bungee down here in the bottom to hold it. And this just snaps on and holds it. And then this will sit on your shoulder strap for easy access to pop that off. One handed use to be able to spray the bear as opposed to a lot of other holsters that are usually a two handed operation or there's two different mechanisms to kind of open it and then get the spray out. So uh, yeah, before we were filming, you were showing me a little bit about um, the construction of this piece. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so like we were saying earlier, uh, you know, the layer to layer adhesion is always the, the crux of 3D printing. So with this, if, you know, this is the end shape that I wanted, but as I'm printing up from here up, all of my layer lines are gonna be, whoops, parallel to the ground, you know, all the way up this tiny little arm here on both sides. So we kept running it into an issue where all that flex as this goes around the bottle would snap off at the layers every single time. So our solution to that is to actually make these two pieces. So now there's a dovetail on both of these. So we'll actually print these separately. So all of the layers in this one are now in the plane with those arms. So that makes it really strong. Lots of continuous layers that go back into the frame of all this. Uh, and then this one is also all the layers are in the uh, Z direction there, keeping it nice and uh, tight geometrically because we also don't want to print it like this because we need to be able to get webbing and stuff through there. So we get the best of both worlds for uh, this piece by printing them actually in two different pieces and then being able to slide them together. And so we'll slide them together and put a little drop of glue in there and then this will be one solid piece, which is much, much stronger than if any other orientation that we could print it in essentially. Sure. Um, I've got one more question before we go and look at your 3D printer, and that's, um, I always like capturing stories um, with regard to licensing and patents and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. And so, is this guy, um, your bear can key, is this currently patented, provisional patent, or tell me about that. So yeah, so both the bear can key and the spray holder, we have provisional patents on right now. Uh, so we're working with uh, a small business uh, lawyer firm that's helping us with those. And then we ha hope to, uh, once we, save up some money from selling these for a little while, uh, hopefully be able to afford right, real patents on them and get those awarded. But yeah, right now it's just provisionals. Um, and what, like, what would, how do you think um, the landscape would look like if you didn't patent these and you just made them? Do you think you would just completely get eviscerated by another company at this point or? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, you know, tough stuff in our industry, especially because a lot of our stuff is, you know, it's, you can't really patent a backpack or a bag or something like that. So all of our other products would be more design patent related. And there's already a lot of, um, we call it duping when people duplicate uh, small brands. A lot of the bigger brands uh, will basically just see something on a smaller cottage in site like us and then just immediately start making their own. So this, you know, is mostly just for our own protection so that it doesn't get scooped up by, you know, some other huge name that makes plastic things and yeah. then you know undercuts us. So it's mostly just to keep this under our house and give us a little bit more protection because yeah. it's a very real possibility that somebody comes and swoops it up. Yeah, so I, I have to ask, um, what would you do if, you're, um, if you were browsing around Thingiverse and you saw, boop, pretty much that? Um, uh, what do you think your strategy would be? I Maybe? guess, yeah, I mean, I would probably email them at some point and like, you know, see what's going on. It's a little harder on Thingiverse because a lot of people aren't selling as much on there. They're just yeah. kind of giving out free files. So, I mean, if they're giving out like a free janky file that's like not our material, it's not going to last as long and they're not selling it and stuff. I'm not as concerned about that, you know, sure. but if, you know, they're making these and they look, you know, pretty much identical and, you know, they're making out of something nice and selling them for money, then yeah. I'm going to have to contact them and then go from there. I don't for know, sure. past that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, very cool. Now let's, uh, let's go take a look at your printer. Yeah. So uh, you said you use uh, a Prusa for a lot of your fixturing and um, lower impact stuff, um, but for your bear can keys and the bear spray keys, you're using a different printer. Can you tell us first about what printer it is and then um, how you ended up with that printer? Uh, yeah, so this is a Marked Forge Mark II printer. Uh, so this is actually a dual extruder printer and their big claim to fame is both their onyx material, which is that uh, microscopic chopped up carbon fiber, but then there's also a second extruder system for their continuous carbon fiber uh, filament, which is basically one continuous strand all the way through the spool. So it'll actually 
uh, you know, leave a cavity when it's printing with the base plastic and then go in and insert that continuous fiber for reinforcement and then cut the fiber and push it in and then go on to its other layers. So this is really cool because you can print everything on either really, really strong base material and then you can reinforce it in different directions with that continuous fiber. Um, and you can pretty much get like uh, aluminum grade strength, you know, materials or prints out of this using that material. Um, but so this has been really great. Uh, it's all cloud-based slicing, which is really cool. So I can send every, everything through my laptop, no matter where I am, upload all the parts, send them to the printer, and I just need to have somebody here to clear the bed and then hit print the next thing, essentially, which is really cool. So software has been great. This has been super reliable. Uh, print quality is awesome, I'll say, geometrically. Like, the, everything is like true to drawing, which is really, really nice compared to my Prusa, which was a lot of draw it, print this, measure it, Calibrate. Adjust the drawing, yeah. <laughs> come back, print it again. But this thing is like tried and true, prints it like every time, just dead nuts on every single time. So it's really cool. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to uh, receive this printer through the uh, Industry i4.0 Integrate Pitch Competition uh, two years ago, uh, which is something that's put on through the Michigan Growth Alliance, part of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, but so yeah, uh, I got this two years ago, uh, and then we're just getting it into production with production scale items and stuff like that. Uh, so this is about $15,000 printer. Um, had we bought this though, our return on investment is still really good. In the last three to four months that we've been selling bear can keys, we've already uh, sold about $11,000 of those coming just from the printer. So taking into account you know our material costs and some other things, that's probably about like eight to ten thousand dollars worth in profit uh, so we expect to be you know if we had bought this machine which we are looking at getting another one uh, depending on our volume and stuff like that uh, the payoff period on this machine is probably five to six months at our current rate right now and we only expect that to go up as we go higher in volume for these 3d printed parts that's awesome and uh if you were to have to have bought something, do you think this would have been the, the Mark Forge would have been something that you got or do you think it would have gone a different direction? Or I think that this is a great option for us. I think um, especially because of all the materials that they have available, they have a few different uh, types of this onyx and then a few other different types of plastic in general that gives us some versatility. Um, as far as industrial printer goes, you know, we could go with something that's maybe a little bit larger. That would be like really the only benefit, I think, you know, as far as accuracy and print quality and stuff like that, this does a great job. The only downside is that the bed's a little small, and so I can only print 100 keys at a time. If I could print 200 at a time, that might be nice, but, you know, you always run the risk of if something happens in the middle of those big prints, then all of your parts are screwed. So sure. <laughs> sometimes small batches are better. Yeah. But this is a great printer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the, the next one we're going to get is going to be uh, one of these ones or maybe the new generation that's coming out. I think they're coming out with a Gen 3 pretty soon. Uh, but, yeah, I would definitely recommend these. <laughs> awesome. Okay, um, so thank you so much. And I have one last question for you, and that is, um, all right, so the audience of these videos are a lot of young engineers and scientists. Um, what advice do you have for um, for them if they're looking to maybe make their own business, like to start something themselves? Yeah, um, my advice is to, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, beholden to an industry or something like that, just keep your eyes open for different problems. Like, you know, any problem that somebody's having, especially in other industries and stuff like that, is a potential opportunity for you to come in and fix that problem and start a business around it. So whether that's, you know, a 3D printing thing like this and you're, prototyping for people or making fixtures or you know whatever it is or you know it could be anything uh, but just keep your eyes and ears open for what other people are having issues with because a lot of times we get in our own lane and we become experts on one thing and not know anything about like oh someone over here is doing something similar that could make my life a whole lot easier so that kind of cross-pollination and keeping your eyes and ears peeled for what's going on in different areas is super good uh, and then as you're starting the business don't be afraid to ask for help. That's like the biggest thing I could probably say is, you know, ask other people for help with whatever your issue is and reach out to, uh, you know, there's a lot of different organizations, the MEDC, the MGA, whole bunch of different places that will point you in the right direction. You know, Mission Works is great too. Uh, 
if you're having an issue, there's a small business that has already had that issue, essentially. And getting the, your network together and asking different people, both that are within the state, uh, you know, for different foundations and things that are to help small businesses, but just networking with other small businesses as well, you're going to get so much, uh, you know, invaluable information about the real ropes and stuff like that, about what running a business is really like. For sure. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>